Get that volume, just bring it. That's better, better. Great, sir. Great to be just able to connect and talk. And uh, I've got some things I'd like to share this morning. Um, and uh, I, I just trying to think what to call this. And I thought, oh, well, uh, <laughs> how, to, how to call the message. I thought, well, lessons learned on the journey. That's probably the best thing. So I thought it's quite good to just um, share with you just a little bit about where we are. And uh, I don't think there's anyone who's part of the church doesn't realize some pressures at times. And certainly right now, it, it's, it's not an easy season. One of the, I have noticed as we've gone around, been really great. We've been able to go around a lot of churches and have a look and see what God is doing in other places. And we have found upheavals and shifts and changes everywhere we go. And some of them are quite profound. And because I'm prophetic, I've been looking to see the things. Well, God, what are you doing in your church? How can we align with what you're doing? That's always the question you want to be thinking. It's not what anyone else is doing. It's what is God doing? And how do I position myself so I can line up with what he's doing? So I want to just talk about our journey and where we are and, and things that just I feel on my heart uh, about it. Late last year, we had the Lord speak about, he spoke to me, um, it was time for a change of leadership. And that was very difficult. Sometimes when God speaks to you, you just, well, what I have learned is this, if you just act on what God gives you with the best understanding you have and just journey the journey of obedience, he works it all out on the way, but it doesn't always work out like you think. How many know that? Well, it doesn't work out like you think. I don't think if, if you knew when you said yes to Jesus where the journey was going to go, would you have said yes or would you be thinking about it a little? <laughs> so journeys aren't always quite like we think and they're not always as, uh, as smooth as we think. So I got advice from outside and they advised me in a certain way. I gave the best advice at the time to let people know we're making this change and then to uh, draw back and uh, the, the expectation was about in April we'd have found a, a way through this change. But April's a long time ago, isn't it? And, uh, and <laughs> then here we are now, August. And so I just want to help you understand where we are and, and what, what I've learned on the way and then perhaps what we need to be looking at as we go forward. I don't have it all worked out, but that's the nature of a faith journey. It says, Abraham journeyed not knowing where he went, but God was leading him. And I think that is called our faith journey in life. Now, I would like to be like lots of other leaders who have these detailed plans. I just am not that kind of person. Wish I was. I feel sometimes quite bad I don't, but I don't have that. I, I tend to flow with what I sense God is on and, and work that way. That's where my strength and gifting lies. So we thought that there would be a change take place about April. So in anticipation of that, I planned in the latter part of my year that Joy and I would be away a little bit more uh, over this next couple of months in anticipation there'd be a shift. And here we are, we're August, we haven't got the change. I can't change the plans. So we just need to look at where we are and, and how we might journey forward. And uh, so I thought I'd just share just a few lessons and things that I'm feeling and picking up. Uh, for both Joy and I, as for many in leadership and those in the church, it's been a very stressful time, very difficult time. I don't think anyone likes uncertainty. I don't like it. And while I may love to operate in faith, I do like to have a measure of certainty. And when it's not certain and it's not that for a while, it becomes very difficult. And uh, however, one of the difficulties is that when things you don't expect, things you expect don't take place, that creates turmoil inside. That's in every arena of life. Unmet expectations can cause us to become uh, uh, confused and, and disconnected. It tells us in Luke 24 that the disciples had certain mindset about how, what God was going to do. They, they, they thought he was going to bring in a kingdom and they were waiting for him to be the great king. They were waiting for a great leader and then their leader died and that blew them out because even though he talked about where, where, what he was doing, even though he explained where he was going, they still didn't get it. And they didn't get it because they had a mindset. And that is, this, it's not people and not different. But here's what happens when you get disappointed. And I think this has happened for a number of people. Uh, is the tendency is to do what the disciples did. And you remember in the, the road to Emmaus, they drew back away from where they were supposed to be. They're supposed to be in Jerusalem. They drew away from Jerusalem. So sometimes when there's uncertainty or, or, or loss of expectation, people draw away from church. They disconnect, and you can't help but notice that some people have done that. It's not easy to manage that, 
it would do it for all kinds of reasons. But it's just, it's when people have unmet expectations, they withdraw and they withhold. And so it, that adds then to the problem. Because instead of now staying in the place that God's appointed them, they now are in a place where they're now in confusion trying to work out what to do. And I've learned, unless God actually ever spoke to me, I'd never move from the positioning God's put me in, even if I'm dying in it. Stay until God says otherwise. And so the, the, the disciples, you notice several things about them. One is they drew away from where they're supposed to be, drew out of their place of functioning, of where they were called. They were sad. Uh, they were trying to reason it all out and trying to figure it all out in their head. And here's the other thing is, when Jesus met them, they didn't even recognize him and see what he was doing. And the lesson's obvious. When we don't have our expectations met, easy to withdraw, easy to disconnect, feel grief, and to not be able to see what God is doing. And, and, and Jesus came alongside them. What he did was just put a fresh download into their hearts and when they saw and were reminded, hey, God is in control and knows where he's going and what he's doing, they then were refired and went back to where they had moved from. So clearly they were in the wrong place for the wrong reasons. And I think that's true for quite a number of, uh, of people. And I just believe that when, when things we expect don't take place, it's important not to focus on what you expected to happen that didn't happen, but keep your attention on what God is doing in your life and uh, become part of the solution for it all. So I had expected that we would have major change. We haven't got it now, and I'm, I feel quite a dilemma and a turmoil. And I don't have a clear answer from the Lord on it. So that's always another, so I'll get to that one too. <laughs> so unmixed expectations can lead to disconnection. So don't, don't disconnect in a time when things are uncertain. Increase your prayer and your time focused on the Lord and connect to people. That would be the most obvious thing, connect to people. And if you see someone drawing away, connect with them and listen to them and help them process the, what they're feeling as they're going through an uncertain time. The second thing is that um, uh, we need to keep our focus on what God is doing and saying and not on our ideas or what we think ought to happen, how it ought to be. And I know that quite a few uh, are saying, well, what's going to happen? What's happening? What's happening? All I can tell you is that we've put together a process that we might appoint a leader. We've uh, met and had uh, three, two interviews and one potential and we haven't come to a sense that God's on any of that so what do you do with that you know you can't deny if God's not on it, God's not on it you just got to live with that and then say what is the way forward and uh, so uh, we need to focus on what God is doing in, in Exodus chapter 3, 1 to 4 you remember the verses of Moses was in, he was out in the middle of a desert well he had an expectation God was going to raise him as a deliverer. He thought it was all touch and go. Here I am. It's all going to go. It didn't work out. He spent 40 years in the desert. And just when he thought all hope is gone, he sees a burning bush. And here's the interesting thing. He focused his attention on something that God was on. He got his eyes not on the fact my life is over, all the hopes and dreams I've had are all done, it's death, despair, what way out of this wilderness. He, he, he didn't. He, he didn't do that. He focused on the bush. And he, the Bible says, he, he said, I'll turn aside and see this bush and see what's going on. And when God saw he turned aside, God spoke to him. And that says a lot you could share about that. But here's what I see is that we have been looking as we go around, what is God on? What churches is he on? And I, I've seen a lot of churches that are, they look incredibly successful, but I scratch the surface and the people are just hurting everywhere. And my conclusion is something is wrong. Jesus is wanting to do something better than that. Now, I'm not critical. I'm just saying that's what we found. Uh, we've gone to some places and, and we've been looking at some places. There's places where the church is ex literally exploding with growth, but they're doing things different. And so I want to know what God is on in this hour. And I want to be working with what God is on. Otherwise, you find yourself stuck in a desert and you can't find your way forward, and so you tend to hold what you're used to. And so, um, so with Moses, when God saw that he, he was willing to look at the bush and see what, what, what God was doing, God then began to speak to him. Now, the Western church, and I, I, I've gone, we've gone to some great churches, and I love them, and we, we minister, lots of things happen, but when I look at it, I think, nah, this can't be what it is. God has got to change this. And I find the things that are in common are high 
uh, high cost of keeping it going, the high energy to run programs, the high performance in it all, and what seems to be missing is authentic community and discipleship. And so I'm looking at all of that stuff thinking, this is not where God is wanting us to go. He's blessing it because he's blessing it because he's God and he blesses his church. But what's for the future? What would that look like? What, what would God be on? And so that's why my attention at the moment is not on what's happening, but what God is on around the world. I'm looking to see where God is moving. So for example, in, uh, I taught, met someone just this year just for chance. And uh, he, we've known him for many, many years, and uh, he's b worked with a lot of these churches. Now I said, well, where are you now? He said, I'm up in Ethiopia, and we've got 280,000 small groups going. I said, oh, that looks like a burning bush, doesn't it? <laughs> he said, there's huge persecution and great miracles, but God is on it. And I said, well, how's it working? And he said, well, we're focused on evangelism and discipleship, and it's organic in that there's a great level of freedom. And he said, the way we're training them has changed. I said, how's it changed? He began to share with me some of the things. I said, oh, that feels right too. And so we're, we're looking to see what God is on. And I can see wherever we go, people are hungry. They're hungry for God. They're hungry for changes and shifts. But there's, there's a need to articulate how a Western church should change to be flowing with what God is doing now in the world. And I think if we, we, our observation is churches, not only in our own town, but, uh, in, but, but across the Western world are, are declining massively. And there's a need for something fresh to happen. And, uh, so my question is, well, why don't keep doing the same things? It's what do we need to be doing that's a little bit different? What do we need to be putting a hand on now? What is God saying to his church, in other words? And when you look at what God is doing, when, when Moses looked at what God was doing, then God began to speak to him. And uh, so I had someone tell me the other day, said, he said, you just need to go where God is moving and see what God is doing. Oh, that's right too. And uh, otherwise, you just keep repeating the same thing. So what's got your attention and focus? See, it's the problems and lacks or the difficulties or the fact that we haven't been able to come up with a nice solution so everyone will feel happy. I wish I could just wrap it up in a package, but I can't. I can't because you can't make God do that. You, you, God is God. We, we follow Jesus, and he doesn't always make it clear. And so I've gone through internal difficulties as long with all of our leadership team, everyone we put in the transition team. I was thinking about them all this morning, and all of them have faced this huge fire. <laughs> and and uh, it's interesting to see as, as different ones are processed it well, they're just coming into enlargement in their personal lives and arena. You haven't seen it in the church yet, but it's happening. But there's been a, definitely a fire, major fire. As I just prophesied over Bryden about a month ago. Must have been five weeks ago. They had, the fire was going to last another month. He shared the worst month in his life. But that's his testimony. He'll give it some time. Uh, but he's come out the other side good. And I was thinking, man, that's a bad prophecy. Fancy prophesying going to stay in the fire another month. But anyway, I felt, well, God, give me something fresh. And then he got something fresh. Yeah, exactly. Give you strength to be able to handle it. So... So we need to focus on what God is doing. So in the midst here, don't look at what problems we may have or difficulties we may have or lacks we may have. Focus on what God is doing. And I would guarantee that it's no one here that is exempt from God trying to do something to shift your life. I'm trying to shift my life. I've been through a heck of a fire and stuff come up. I never even realized it was there. And I think, how do I change? You know? And I, I've become aware of limitations. I've become aware of, of, of where I'm really good and where I shouldn't be. <laughs> I thank God for others that can be there and do things I can't do. So focus on what God is on and listen to what he's saying. Here's, here's the, th the next thing, next lesson on the journey. Uh, you need to resist pressure to just get a solution so you feel safe. You need to resist pressure. Now, uh, Everyone wants to have the plan and have everything worked out. And so when it's not like that, some personalities can handle it. They flow. She'll have a crew. She'll be right. Others go into a high alarm. And, uh, and, and if you're a, a, a detail kind of person, this is high alarm territory right now. And, uh, and I do understand that. Um, but the thing is, when you're in high alarm, the tendency is to push to get a solution, and then you miss what God wants. 
And this is always a difficulty. So there's a couple of scriptures, you might you remember them, I'll just quote them. In 1 Samuel 8 verse 5, there was a problem in leadership under Samuel, he was a great prophet, and there were difficulties in the leadership under that. Everyone said, we want a king like everyone else. Isn't that interesting? They wanted a king. They want someone to govern them and rule them and tell them what to do. This was not God's heart for them. He had a king who was a different kind of king. And they, they wanted their king who looked like everyone else and Jesus and God spoke to them and he wasn't happy about it. He said, that's what you want. You, okay, that's what you want. You can have that, but he'll take. He'll take, 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 take. So that's what they wanted. And uh, we've got to be careful in our, um, that we don't reject what God is doing in favor of what we would like to feel good. Isn't that true? Now, here's one thing is that the leadership that God is raising up in the world that's having effect is very different to what it's been for the last two decades. So if we don't get a clear grip on that, we'll just want a king like someone else. See, that, that's that's what will happen. And I've been telling our leadership team, we don't need someone who's a strong ministry gift to lead the church. That's where I was for my season and now might need to be released into what I'm doing but the church needs a different kind of leadership for the 21st century the corporate community is aware of it they're all changing their leadership patterns it's all very collaborative and team and and they, they have a team leader but it's a highly collaborative kind of deal um, and and church has to become that but to do that the church got to realize that's what we need and it'll require humility and change to get that that's interesting. So the, the business community is going already shifted a lot in that regard, but the church usually is behind the world in every area. And so a, a dilemma is that, that the leadership God is wanting, and I'm looking around at different styles of leadership and whatever, there's many different styles. Now the church needs to be led, but it needs to actually, let me give you a little tip on this. If you watch what God has been doing, keep your eye on what God has been doing, 50s, Evangelists were raised, 60s, pastors raised, 70s, teachers raised, 80s, prophets, 90s to 2000, apostles. So God's obviously doing something. So did he just stop? And is it all about apostles now? No, not at all. No, here's what it is. It's about them all working together, collaborative teamwork, and, and the church getting going, doing what it's supposed to do. So the movement is away from what leaders do and onto what church is doing. It's about being the church in the community, and that's why God is wakening in people's hearts dreams, desires, and disturbing and shaking people. He wants you to get vision for what your life can become. And so the church's role is to help you become that. Think about that. So what, does, what changes would that mean? So I'm just seeing what I, I'm telling you what I'm seeing. <laughs> so we're called to equip, but equipping track. See, here's the thing. How many of you understand that growing is a lifelong journey, not just you go through an equipping track or go through a, or, or through a course? See, some people, they go to the freedom retreat and say, well, I've done that, been there, done that, I can move on. What a joke. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I went there, got my demons out, I'm right. That's absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Does that mean you become like Jesus, does it? Does it mean you become like Jesus? Because that's God's plan is to make us like Jesus. And that plan will continue until you get like him. So, welcome to the world of growing. Think about that. So, now, most people don't think that way. They think church on Sunday. They don't think actually what it's really about. And I felt like we need to be defining what it's about and starting to get the church so that it operates that way. So, a, a second aspect is that we see is that um, if, if we respond to pressure, we'll inevitably make bad decisions. You think in 1 Samuel 13 of Saul, and Saul was facing three things. I know these three things. I've had them before, and I'm having them right now. They're, they're not nice when you have this. Uh, number one, he had mounting pressures. Mounting pressures. The enemy were coming against him. It was mounting pressures. And so it could be it's financial pressures or every kind of pressure you have. And for us, it's been financial pressure. And God can bring pressure. He can bring financial pressure. He's brought financial pressure. I've been to churches all over the place. And many have struggled. Financial pressure, had layoffs, done all kinds of things. They had to change. God just getting our attention. Change. 
You can bring earthquakes can be used to change everything. Christ Church churches all had to change because of the earthquakes. They had to wake up. Some of them lost half their people in one six months. Hundreds, hundreds just went. Where'd they go? No one knows. They just vanished. Imagine we're building a church and suddenly it's all over in one day. Can you see that? And, and, but, but it was also its finest hour because the churches were the ones that arose in the midst of the calamity and did something. So the first thing is pressure or problem. The second thing is where people were leaving. The people were leaving and were going away and they were hiding in the thickets. They were, the Bible says they were in the caves. Caves and thickets. That's a good thing. I'd like to think about that more. Caves and thickets. So people, when they feel a bit of pressure and stress, often hide away in caves and thickets. I think we've got lots of people hiding away in caves and thickets. <laughs> caves are cold, dark places, by the way. And then the, the third thing was, God wasn't seeming to be showing any interest or loving kindness or care. He didn't come up with an answer. And so Saul sweated because he's under pressure externally. God isn't coming. He's mounting pressures and difficulties. And people are becoming upset and irritated and whatever. This is a leadership challenge. You've actually got to handle it and say, I'll wait on God. And I won't make something happen. He said, I forced myself. And the prophet said to him, you've done stupidly. That was a crazy move. You were about to enter your finest hour, and you've just blown it big time, and now your whole kingdom will disappear. That's a biggie, isn't it? That's written for us to learn from, isn't it? So maybe you're under pressure. Well, don't make any decisions under pressure. Wait till the pressure's diminished till your head's clear, and make sure that you're focused on what God is doing. Amen? God likes us to trust him. So here's, a, here's another lesson. When, when, when there are delays, when, when there are delays, what's in our heart comes up to the surface. That's how God uses delays. He uses delays to surface what's in us. Get impatient, get frustrated. Get In, in Exodus 15, uh, verse 20 to 26, God had a great plan, move the people forward. He said, Moses, tell them, here's the plan, move forward. So they all move forward, and then here we are, three days out, and there's no water. Now, did God know there's no water? He knew there's no water. Now, we were, we're, here we are, eight months out, no leader. And, and, and no one in sight even at the moment. I'm thinking, oh, heck. That's just not fair. That happens. You know, I wish I could solve it easily, but I can't solve it. But, so what happened was, some start to complain. Nothing new is there under the sun. Some start to complain. And their complaining indicated their lack of trust that God would work with them and help them. See? They just were complaining. And then... The tr then what they face, what, what happens is the waters they did get were bitter. And what really God was saying is this. I have an inheritance for you, now, but there's a mentality change you've got to come into. I'm wanting you to stop having a slave mentality where you're told what to do and you just do what you're told and you just obey instructions. I want you to come into sonship where you have an identity and you relate to your father and you trust your father and there's a dialogue and the dreams in your heart and, and what God has for you are able to be expressed. Now, you have a look globally. That's a message that God's bringing out everywhere. Right. Moving away from just a mindless listening and doing what you're told to into coming into identity as a son and having dreams. And so you notice all around the world movement around purpose and destiny and dreams and all that kind of thing. God's want to unlock people in the church. But for you to unlock, let me tell you this. I've, I've been working in this area now for some time, recently particularly. You know what I've noticed? Is people will never arise to their dreams if they can't dream. And if you've got identity issues and bondages in the heart, you are a slave. And you'll stay a slave and won't fulfill your destiny until you let your heart get unlocked. And getting the heart unlocked means dealing with anger and bitterness and resentment. I was reading an article recently that said worldwide they see the church mired in deep bitterness. How about that? And it's, see, bitterness doesn't show easily, but it shows up with complaining and blaming. Think about that. So what is God trying to get up to the surface in your life right now? What is it in the last three to four months has surfaced that you're saying, God, I need to look at that. I need to deal with that. I need to get some help in that. And, and if we did something for you, here's a couple of questions. 
if we put on something to help you get to that, would you come? And if you came and went to that, would you think, I'm fixed, I'm right now, I've been there, done that? <laughs> See, for some of you, you would think, well, I've been through a retreat and I've done this and I've done that. Actually, what I've discovered is this, is that God unravels your life in layers. And so he brings fresh things up or he brings an old thing up at a different level. And the journey of change, repentance and faith are the foundations of our, of our walk with God. And you don't ever stop repenting. That means you must be changing. I think we pushed a button there. So I'm in a process of painful change. It's, it's not easy. So, so, so God lets these things come up to so he can sort it out. He's got the way of bringing the pressure. So what are you doing? Are you complaining? Here's the thing. Here's an, uh, let me just talk about some things God's on, then I'll finish up. One of the things, and Lynn brought out a great word. I haven't heard it all yet, but she told me some of it. And I thought, boy, that's so true. God's want to change the wineskin. Okay. Now, what's a wineskin? Do wine holds the wine. Wineskin holds the wine. Now, what is a wineskin? That is wonderful. God says, new, new wine needs a new wineskin, so we all want more anointing. But, but what's it for? It's always for a purpose. You don't get more anointing unless you're going to embrace God's purpose. It's as simple as that. I go over there and people say, oh, pray for double portion. Double says, get away from me. Leave me alone. You're not getting a double portion because you haven't got a heart to serve and do what God wants you to do. Get the serving right and the double portion comes. So, so, so anyway, the wineskin. So wineskin are mentalities, first of all. They're mindsets. They are mindsets. The way you think about church and the way you think what it means to be a Christian. The Bible says in the New Testament they call disciples Christians. We call lots of people Christians who are not disciples. And, I, and so one of the things I'm, I'm seeing in the Scripture the Lord's focused me on very much in this last few months, is follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. In other words, Jesus is saying, get busy following him with all that means. Make pursuit of Jesus a life pursuit. He says, I'll make you. That means continuous growth. So instead of thinking a breakthrough service, a breakthrough meeting, a breakthrough retreat, think continuous breakthrough because I've embraced the process of learning how to change. And just to add to that, one of the things, so wineskins are about mentalities, wineskins are about attitudes, wineskins are about the structures. It's about all of those things. Now get how hard it is to change. How many know that Jesus spoke to his church and said, I want you to preach gospel Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the utmost parts of the earth. How many know that? How come they stuck in Jerusalem? And secondly, having stuck in Jerusalem, how did God get them out of Jerusalem? It's really easy. They stuck in Jerusalem because they thought that's where all the action should be. And how did he get them out? He killed James, the brother of Jesus, was murdered. Oh, how about that? You all think you're hurt and wounded. Get over it. It's absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Go into Ethiopia where they suffer and die and they're killed. They're being hurt and wounded. This, you need to understand that we're called to embrace the cross, a life of following Jesus Christ. That's what, the, that's what the Christianity is about. And there's sacrifice in it. And there are challenges and there are inconveniences. We're called to take up our cross daily. So does hurt come? Yes, it comes. Now, this is, how, this is what got the attention of the church in the New Testament. The brother, the very brother, you think of everyone who'd be safe, it would be the brother of Jesus, the younger brother. He got killed. He got martyred. The church went into shock. And then a persecution arose against the church and they were scattered. Now, I guess there's a lot of hurt people there. They're being, but they've got something to be hurt about. They're being driven out of their homes, beaten up, put into prison, th thrown to lions, burned at the stake, all that kind of stuff. They've got a real reason to be unhappy. Like many Christians around the world. But here's what, they, here's what happened. They preached the gospel everywhere they went and the gospel went out. Now, do you think that God who did that in the New Testament church has got the ability to get the church of today out of its place and out into the world bringing the gospel? We're going to rattle our cage big time. Think about it. Think about Peter and his reluctance when he had a vision even to go to the Gentiles. That's called a mindset or a wineskin. So mindsets are about how we view the church and what the church is, how we view our life with God. And I'm saying, Lord, 
tell me what you're doing, help me to see how it's supposed to be, give me the courage to work to, to articulate it and to change it. So, wineskin. So one of the things that's in the wineskin that God's changing is this issue of discipleship, Jesus' last command. Now, his last command was not have revival meetings. His last command was very specific, make disciples. Make disciples and teach them how to obey and walk with God, how to walk the life in the Spirit. Make disciples. That's the last mandate. So I asked the question, wonder what a disciple is? I had a bit of trouble answering that one. And then the question, well, how do you make them? I got a bit stuck there too. So I realized that's a wineskin problem. So I need some help with that. So we started to look now around the world who is successful. Now I suddenly find churches of thousands, 40,000 in Manila, all in discipleship things. Now, and, and the thing about groups now is this, because everyone is wanting to become a disciple of Jesus and are taught to become a disciple of Jesus. Follow me, I'll make you to become a disciple, a fisher of men. It obviously means pursuing Jesus, committed to growth, and engaging with people to gather them into the kingdom. That's clearly the mandate. Now, here's the thing. To grow, you need people to stand with you and support you. This thing of just being so tough you don't need one to help you grow, that's, that's a wineskin. Basically, we need people to help. We need to be in community and relationship. Now, one of the difficulties with small groups is often it's about me coming together and we have a pray and a good time together and, and, and we get blessed and, and we get a teaching and so on. And, and that's all wonderful. But what if it was like this, that you are committed to growth and you've got people around you who'll help you on the journey to grow and you know you need them because you just won't keep up with your commitments unless you've got someone saying, how are you doing? See, this is, it's changing in the thinking. And these are the sorts of things I'm feeling the church has got to embrace and change in. Heaps of things like that. I'll just give you one other and then close in what, where, where we could go, what we can do. So in terms of a solution, I haven't got it yet, but I see the discipling. Another clear emphasis is on relationships and organic connection. Now, we, we've struggled a bit with that. We have some things that are really good. We have some great things happen, but... There are some areas of relationship we've got to get a handle on how to build great relationships and how to build friendships. And that means your focus is on people and building with people, not on just doing stuff. So th there's a huge shift in there around these areas. Um, uh, God's focusing on identity, people discovering who they are, it's on mer works of mercy. Get this, here's a church. Get this church here. This church here is in Hollywood. Church is about 2,000 people. And they've got about 2,000 attend in this church. It's in, a, it's in, a, it's in a, a hall they rent, which was used formerly as a nightclub, and it's got all of these idols of Egypt up on the walls. How about that? And so that causes some Christians to get upset when they go there. But the people who are running it are not worried at all because it's only a building, you know. We're, we're on about the gospel. It's got power to change anyone. But here's the thing. They've got about 2,000 in church. How many have they got in small groups? They've got 2,000 in small groups. And they've got about 2,000 people serving, and they've got about 2,000 people engaging in the community in works of mercy. Now, how many of those are saved? They're not sure, but they know there's a lot that are unsaved. Well, isn't that a bit of a shock? That's about as bad as God allowing an unmanned, unsaved person to pray for someone to get healed, and they got healed. It's on that same level, isn't it? And don't tell me there wasn't a bit of inside you in that. But just God won't be contained. He's bigger than us. We've got to believe bigger and get out of our small boxes. So these are things that God is doing now. And so I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, help me. I feel like, what have I been doing for the last 28 years or something? But however, you just work with what you have and for what you know. So I just think our church is a great church. I think we have great people. You are great people. Absolutely. I can take... Most of you anywhere in the world and you touch the lives of people with what you have. You know, Sue just went over to, to America last year and she did, went to a conference there. And she didn't get to sing or do anything, but they just recognized what she had and invited her into the round table of the prophetic, of the, of the worship leading, yeah, worship, worship uh, people in America. So how does someone from, from off a farm suddenly get there onto the round table in America? How does that happen? And didn't even do anything. Just turned up for a conference. 
That's, that's God's hand on people, isn't it? Yeah, we can repeat that story over and over and over. See, see, so I think this is a great church. I watched with uh, Ao and Bookie and how everyone just stood up and gave and their problem was solved to the tune of $12,000 or something. That's great people, generous people. So God's telling me again about the need for kindness and generosity to be around our lives. So what, what can we do? Well, here's some things. I'd love you just to pray for us. I face the dilemma. I haven't solved the problem of how we shift and move leadership. And I can't solve it immediately. I don't have a solution. And what's adding to that is I'm committed for, for the next two months or so to be out quite a bit. However, on the plus side, we have great team here. Great people. Have confidence in them and pray for them and support them and believe in them. Just let God work through them. Because one thing God's wanting to do, breaking a wineskin, he's wanting to break your idolatry of dependence on me. So if you find that there are people mad at me, just do remember there's probably that there's been an idolatry going on and the idol fell and didn't come up as expected. And that does make people very angry. It does. So I think that when you have strong ministry gift, the problem is idolatry and unnecessary dependency. And I think God's been seeking to break that. And so the distance and space and allowing others to move and do things has been all a part of breaking the wineskin in preparation for the new things that will happen. And it'll be different to what we're used to, but it'll be great because God's on it. Anything God's on is great. <laughs> so, so we have that. So here's the thing. Please just pray for the current leadership and for the church. Stay in a place of prayer for us all at this time as we journey forward. God's got the answers. We've just got to be willing to change our mindsets to see them. The idea? I mean, we're probably like Peter when God said, here, go, go, and give him the vision. And someone comes and invites him for a meal, and he says, no, I can't do that. I don't eat with the Gentiles. You know, I don't do that. It, it, that's the kind of mindset you can't, we don't do that. That sort of, I don't do that, needs to change in the church, eh? So we get really what's important, which is people. People are what's important. So I encourage you, if you're not in a group, connect in a group. Get in a small group. Get starting to build relationships. Because out of connection, your problems magnify. Um, connect with people. You see someone who hasn't been around for a while, go talk to them. I don't tell them what to do or tell them to do this or that. Find out their heart and connect with them and help them with whatever they got just to make the journey forward. See what God's doing. You don't have to try and make people do anything. You just help them see what God is doing. Let them choose to do that. Get an idea? So that, I think that would be a, a big help. I think if you've got personal issues, face them. If stuff's been coming up and you find that there's things coming out of you which are a bit nasty, you need to let God help you grow. This is about grow. Grow time. Grow time. So one, one thing is when, when, we, when Lynn puts on a seminar next, whenever it's going to be, show up. And show up not saying, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this. Come, this is the way you come. Look at what you're currently facing and struggling with and make a decision. I'll use this as an opportunity to find what's driving it and break out of it. How about that? That'd be great. Don't come and say, oh, I know all that stuff. I know this, I know this. No, 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 no. Come, come expecting God to do something. Lynn's a burning bush. I'm sure if you turn aside and you know, something will happen. <laughs> Something's going to happen. You'll hear God speak to you. Another thing, too, is remain faithful. God watches what we do. There is a tendency when it's difficult times for people to withhold their giving. And that's increased our stress immensely, immensely, and still continues to do so. So if you've done that, ask yourself, I wonder why am I doing it? Are you trying to punish me or the church or something? Punish God? You know? Don't do that. Stay faithful in your giving. That's the way to keep walking with God no matter what. Stay faithful in attending. Don't sort of think, well, Pastor Mike's not there. I wonder who's up this. Oh, I don't think I'll go. No, don't think that way. You know, don't think that. That's, that's not actually walking with the Spirit. It's walking in the flesh. You know, and, and stay serving. Don't sort of quit and say, oh, I've had enough. I've, I've gone beyond that now. Oh, well, you have gone beyond any help, you know. <laughs> really. You know, you know, serving, if you want to be great in the kingdom, it's the path is downwards. It's not about your positioning. It's actually about serving. So your question is, if I want to be great, how many people am I serving? And if you're not serving anyway, you think, ooh, 
What a small package I've become. As I get there, I need to go to that, per- I need to turn up to the burning bush. I need to figure out where I've gone off the rails. So th- these are things that are happening. I encourage us all to make these good decisions. Good decisions in difficult times is what brings you into growth and enlargement. So reach out to connect with people, gather people. It's a 10. Let's be there for prayer, there for worship and come. Let's stand together in a time when it is difficult and it's a bit uncertain. And I tell you what, God's watching us. He is watching us. He is watching us. I, do not, I work on not complaining. I work on not complaining. I know he's listening. And I want to actually come out saying, God, I heard what you wanted me to do and change, and I've done it. Now open up the next season with great anointing and glory. Say amen. Amen. God bless you. Father, we just pray for Bay City, for the leadership, the church. We pray, Lord, in this next season, Lord, there'll be just a great flow of favor, presence upon us, and you'd give us wisdom to work out our way forward when the way seems unclear. I thank you, Lord, for the call on joining me to Hastings, to the city, to this church, which has never left. And I thank you also for the call into the global scene. Lord, I pray you'll help us to work out how all this works out. We believe our best days are ahead as we continue to listen and walk with you and determine to become followers of Jesus and great people. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Gone a little bit over time. I just want to thank you for your patience on that. Um, We're away just one weekend, be back the weekend after. God bless you.